Well, hello everyone. This is Patrick uh, speaking. Thanks for joining me today for this webinar. We're going to be speaking about one of the most urgent and concerning issues in African conservation right now, the plight of the African rhino. Uh, this is the first time AWF has done a live update like this. Um, we're trying it out. We're going to offer these periodically and at the end um, we'll ask you for some feedback that can guide our, our future webinars and see if this is something that, um, that you appreciate and it's beneficial. As I speak about the African rhino, you'll see that you have a dialog box, and if you would like to, you can submit um, questions. And at the end of my presentation, I'll take some of those questions and respond to them as time allows. And then if there are questions that I can't get to, uh, someone from AWF will respond to that question within the next 24 hours and get back to you. So let's jump in and talk about the African rhino. I'm recently back from trips to both Africa and China. Um, working on rhino issues and, and I'm going to speak to you about, about both. Um, first thing is that of course when we talk about the African rhino we're actually talking about two species. I'm sure you're familiar with this. The first is the black rhino, um, also sometimes called the hook lip rhino. It, uh, this is a browser um, that lives in the woodland and strips leaves off of branches. I love this photograph of a mother rhino with her calf uh, galloping behind her and you can see she still has a mouthful of browse in, 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 in her mouth just to just to demonstrate my point and of course the second species is the white rhino also sometimes called the white mouth rhino which is a which is a grazer and eats grass this slide again shows you the difference between the two animals the black rhino having a slightly smaller um, body size here you can see them again a black rhino stripping leaves off of a, of a downed uh, yellow acacia tree here. Another great photograph. And again, um, white rhinos in action um, mowing the grass. Now, both of these species of the African rhino um, really have been hunted and killed mercilessly over the last century, coming very close to extinction. The 1970s and 1980s were particularly bad for both rhino and elephant poaching. Um, during these years, the white rhino had gone from over 100,000 individuals, and by 1895, there were less than 100 individuals remaining. For the black rhino, um, in the late 1960s, there were still estimated to be about 70,000, and that number eventually went down to about 2,400. So you can see both species of rhino really decimated. Their numbers reduced by over 95%. That was partly local hunting. It was partly habitat loss. It was partly sport hunting. Here you can see an old historic photograph of Teddy Roosevelt on safari in Africa with his rhino. So the, the numbers of rhino dramatically, dramatically reduced. Um, however, for the past two decades, there have been very organized efforts to slowly rebuild the rhino population, to rebuild the total number, the genetic diversity, and the distribution of rhinos. And this has actually been um, a great conservation success story, led really by South Africa and South Africa National Parks, some other key agencies like KwaZulu-Natal Conservation Agency. Um, rhinos have been bred. They have been relocated to sanctuaries and private reserves. Um, here you can see rhino being crated up and moved to some of the new locations. And so very systematically, the conservation community has been rebuilding rhino numbers. And up until, say, three years ago, 2009, this was sort of the picture that we had. This map shows you the distribution of white rhino, um, the countries that have white rhino, you know, South Africa, Namibia, um, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Zambia, and then also reintroduced into Kenya, as you can see in this map. And black rhino, um, all of those same countries with the addition of, uh, of Tanzania, which has rhino um, in a few places, in Gorongoro Crater, Serengeti, and the Salu Game Reserve. And um, very interesting that there are only four countries that together account for the overwhelming majority of rhinos, 98%. Those four countries, South Africa, Namibia, Kenya, and Zimbabwe. And... Um, you know, I'm sort of a round figures guy, so the way I like to think about it is that there are roughly 20,000 white rhino in the world today and, and roughly 5,000 black rhino. That has been the state of play up until, about, up until about 2009. Now, the rhino poaching crisis that we saw in the 70s, 80s had its own dynamic. 
um, one of the big driving factors of that crisis was the demand for rhino, carved rhino dagger handles, ornamental daggers that are worn by Yemeni's men. And he, here you see a picture of, in the Yemeni's market of someone buying one of these ceremonial daggers um, with a carved rhino horn. The poaching that has um, started up recently again seems to have a completely different source and a, and a different dynamic. Poaching began again about three years ago. Um, we hoped at first that it was an anomaly, that it was just a rare glitch in security that would be rapidly shut down. However, it's now become clear that this is actually a whole new epidemic of poaching. And um, I've been calling it World War II for the rhinos. It's, it's like the whole, the whole problem over again. Um, in terms of the demand and where this is coming from, it seems quite clear that it is being driven by newly affluent uh, middle class and Asian economies, uh, particularly China, Vietnam, Thailand, and, and perhaps other countries. We know that there are users of Chinese traditional medicine and ethnic Chinese communities really throughout Southeast Asia, and, and this seems to be where the demand for rhino horn is coming from. Um, in terms of the uses, there are all sorts of, of, of myths and, and rumors um, circulating, but one of the ones that seems to be most disturbing is a, is a press article about a minister having used a medicinal preparation with rhino horn to be cured of cancer. And so this is now driving um, the new epidemic, the new demand for rhino horn. Also, unlike the 70s, there is a new set of tools and tactics being used by poachers to conduct poaching and to kill rhinos. One of the most disturbing is the use or misuse of veterinary drugs. Um, Rhinos are being tranquilized, and then uh, people go in, cut off the horn, often very crudely. You've probably seen some of the disturbing photographs of rhinos that have had their horns removed. Other techniques are using, including poison crossbows um, and helicopters. Um, it's been determined that rhino horn is getting from the scene of the crime into the hands of the users in Asia very, very quickly, in hours or days as opposed to weeks and months like it used to be in the past. So this is a new epidemic of poaching, and, and it has its own characteristics. Just to give you sort of the, the, the current state of play um, that, that's very disturbing, um, between 2006 and 2009, 95% of the rhinos lost have been in South Africa and Zimbabwe, over 1,000. Um, rhinos lost in recent years. We're now up to about two rhinos being lost per day. So the, the, the trend is actually getting worse. And 118 rhinos killed within the first 74 days of, our, of this current year. Now, AWF and other conservation groups have been watching this trend with, with great concern. Because so much of the poaching has been in South Africa, and because South Africa, relatively speaking, has more resources to combat the problem, we sort of thought and hoped that it would, that it would be contained quite quickly. Um, a tipping point for us was the Christmas holiday season this last year. Uh, many of you may know that the tradition in a lot of Africa over Christmas is that everything just shuts down. People go on holiday and businesses close really for several weeks. Uh, I received a phone call on the morning of January 3rd from several of our trustees, of our AWF trustees in South Africa. And um, what we found out was that 100 and seven rhinos were poached over the holiday period from late November through December. And they said to me, Patrick, you know what? Everybody took off for Christmas except the poachers. The poachers actually intensified their work over the Christmas holiday. So um, we were very disturbed by this and just felt that something had to be done. We knew that a lot of, a lot of people were doing things. Uh, conservation groups were doing things. Private landowners were doing things. The national park agencies in different countries were doing things. But we were also concerned that in some cases those efforts were small and they were fragmented. You know, someone's put ad in the newspaper, someone's selling little yellow bracelets that say Save the Rhino on them. But the question was, do these things add up to a sufficient response by the African conservation community to the scale of this threat? And our determination was, no, they probably don't. And, and, and so we started asking around. We consulted with government wildlife authorities and all the rhino range states. We talked to non-state actors like the private ranch owners, and we talked to other conservation organizations, and we all agreed that it was worth taking the time to come together, 
and um, and really map out a comprehensive strategy to the to the rhino crisis. Um, the Board of African Wildlife Foundation passed emergency funding for the summit in January, and the first two first several days of April, April first, second, and third, we gathered together at the AWF Conservation Center in Nairobi. Um, a group of representatives from all the key rhino range states. So we had representatives from South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Tanzania, and Kenya. And, and as I mentioned before, um, national parks, private ranch owners, and, and the conservation community so that we could sort of put our heads together and try and address this very serious problem. Now, I want to spend the rest of my time telling you what some of the conclusions and outcomes of this rhino summit were. Um, the spirit of the summit was very good. People came together and said, hey, anyone who's got any differences or whatever, put them behind you. Now is not the time. We, we have a real crisis here. Um, and, and so I, I want to say sort of the spirit of collaboration in the meeting was, was outstanding. The first thing that we talked about was sort of on the ground um, in the specific locales where rhinos are being conserved, national parks, sanctuaries, private reserves. Everybody recognized the importance of good surveillance, that there has to be monitoring and law enforcement, there has to be intelligence. Um, you've got to have rangers. Those rangers have to be well equipped. Um, they have to have cars, they have to have radios, they have to have boots, they have to be you know, properly equipped and all those things. Some of the countries like South Africa, Namibia, and Kenya have quite sophisticated capacity and a lot of equipment and so forth to do on the ground security operations. There are other countries that were very straightforward and said they have almost none. Um, Zambia is an example of a country. They lost all of their rhino, every single one. They have a few now that have been reintroduced, but their capacity to do on-the-ground law enforcement remains very low. I would say that Tanzania's capacity to do anti-poaching is also relatively low. So some of the discussion in the meeting was about how the stronger countries can help the weaker countries. You know, it's not rocket science. Um, some things have been figured out about how to do the patrolling. A lot of the poaching happens during the full moon for 10 months, for 10 nights before the full moon and 10 nights after the full moon. So how to deploy your resources, when to use your manpower, there's a lot of knowledge about that and that can be shared with the countries that, that need the help. A second interesting part of the discussion in the Rhino Summit was about technology. Um, there have been some breakthroughs and some experiments with new technology. I mentioned the poachers are using new technology, so it's sort of a technology arms race. And um, we also, the conservation community, we have to scale up the technology that we're using. Um, there are a couple of interesting things. Uh, the Namibians are actually experimenting with a drone, an unmanned drone. Um, they're building it themselves out of a kit because it's much cheaper, they're able to build, a, I think, a drone for $250, something like that. And you know, Namibia is quite dry, and the rhinos are, are dispersed over much larger areas. So they're using drones to pick up signs of incursions by, by poachers or suspicious people into the, into the rhino areas. Um, some interesting work has been done on collaring. If you think of the rhino and the shape of the body, you know, with wildlife, it's very common to use net collars, but with rhinos, frequently, the width of the neck is bigger than the head. So if you put a collar around the neck, it, it can fall off. And so um, work has been done on leg collars. Um, work has been done on sonar, which is also um, effective but very expensive, particularly over large areas. One of the technologies that we heard about that I thought was quite simple but apparently quite effective is that in sanctuaries, people are putting quite simple and cheap um, electric alarms on sections of fence. And as soon as any section of the fence is disturbed, it will give an alarm and tell you which direction the intrusion is coming from. Um, we heard from one private ranch that most of the alarms they get are caused by tortoises bumbling through the fence at night, but they think it's a good thing and it keeps the rangers on their toes. So that might be a cost-effective way to go. Um, all that said, you know, a lot of the participants in the summit, and particularly the South Africans, told us, you know what, we've doubled the number of rangers, we've doubled the number of Land Rovers on the ground, and we're still not putting a dent in this problem. In fact, it's getting worse. So we're not saying to stop the efforts on the ground. Of course, we're going to do it. But what we're saying is um, this problem needs to be addressed at other levels. So a bit about those other levels.
I'm sure you've all seen CSI, you know, CSI Miami or CSI, I can't remember what the, what the locations are, but there are a lot of examples where um, someone is apprehended with a rhino horn, and it is impossible to actually tie that rhino horn back to a crime scene. So perhaps a rhino was shot, perhaps even a human being was killed in the, uh, in the act of taking that rhino horn. Someone's caught with a rhino horn, where'd you get the rhino horn? Oh, I found it. You know, it was in the boot of my rental car. I don't know where it came from. And, and the law enforcement authorities can't prove otherwise. So there is now a push to completely catalog uh, the DNA of all remaining rhino in Africa. It's a big task, but it's not an impossible task. There are about 25,000 animals. There would be scientific benefits to doing this. So um, there, there's a push afoot, of, uh, of and we're trying to raise money our, ourselves and other people to completely catalog all rhinos on the continent. And one of the benefits will be that future rhino horns that are apprehended will be tied back to a specific crime scene. Now, another part of the discussion at the summit, in fact, what I think was, was perhaps maybe the most interesting thing that I learned in the summit, is about prosecution and law enforcement. When the current rhino poaching crisis started, South Africa had a terrible record of success in prosecutions. In fact, it was between 3 and 4 percent. Everybody was getting away with it because they couldn't prove it. And further, judges, policemen, customs officials, they didn't take it seriously. They're like, oh, they shot an animal. What's the big deal? You know, it's just a wildlife crime. And of course, this is very, very discouraging. You know, you've got people out there putting their lives on the line, and, and, and the state is having no success in, in prosecuting this crime. What South Africa did is they took a look at the legislation in the United States that I'm sure you've heard of called RICO, the Racketeering Influenced Corrupt Organizations Act. This is the legislation that was used to bust the mafia. And you might remember in the old days, you know, the mafia bosses, they could never tie them to a murder. But once the RICO legislation was passed, they started to get them on, on uh, tax evasion and all these other crimes. This same approach is now being used in South Africa. We were told that the Parliament of South Africa has issued a proclamation that all rhino crimes will now be considered organized crime and will be prosecuted under the legislation in South, Af South Africa that is now called POCA, the Prevention of, um, of, of Crime, of Organized Crime Act. And so as a result of using this, they are able to collect multiple charges against people, immigration offenses, tax offenses, um, firearms offenses, tax evasion, smuggling, conspiracy, all these things. In some cases, human trafficking, because in some cases they're using, they're using people to commit these crimes. Also, when they do seize someone and prosecute them, like RICO, they are able to seize assets. If an aircraft was used in the commission of the crime, they seize the aircraft. If a house was used, they seize the house. If bank accounts were used, they seize the house. So um, since adopting this whole approach that wildlife will be treated as organized crime, not as wildlife crime, the success rate for prosecution in South Africa has gone to something like 90%. It's in the 90s. So what we want to do is to get more range states, rhino range states in Africa to take a look at the South African legislation and to consider adopting similar legislation. Now, just a couple of other things um, that I want to mention. I've talked so far mainly about sort of the supply side, uh, what we do in Africa to protect rhino. We also think coming out of the summit there are things to be done on the demand side. Um, public awareness within uh, Asia and the consuming countries. Um, actually, African Wildlife Foundation has signed a memorandum of understanding with a group called Wild Aid to prepare a public awareness campaign um, to sensitize people in the consuming countries about the suffering that it causes when rhinos are killed. We heard the story of a, of a sophisticated Chinese businesswoman who thought that rhino horn was like a deer antler and it fell off once a year. So in some cases we think the consumers don't even understand that they are stealing a resource that belongs to the continent and um, public awareness is going to be needed in, in those economies. And, and perhaps finally, um, we think it's necessary to reach out to government leaders in the consuming countries at the highest level. Here you see a picture of the Vice President of South Africa meeting with the Chinese Premier um, Wang Jiabao in Beijing. And um, I'm also recently back from China meeting with officials there. AWF and the Aspen Institute are looking at uh, 
organizing um, a policy forum that will combine senior Chinese officials with senior African officials to talk about trade and so forth between between the two regions. So in closing, um, I just want to say I think that there is real indignation in Africa at this time that a resource that is both an economic resource and part of the continent's heritage is being sort of blatantly stolen out from under our noses by criminals and that there are steps that we can take um, to protect this resource and sort of to protect our own dignity and um, the outcome of the summit belongs to all of the participants. So AWF is considering the steps that we can take to, to fund and to support some of the activities identified. We hope that other partners will be picking up some of these activities and that we can indeed um, arrest this problem and, and start to get rhino numbers growing again. So thank you for, uh, for listening. I, I now have some of the questions that some of you have, um, have submitted during the course of the talk. Um, one of the questions is about dehorning, the question of removing a rhino's horn to stop, uh, to stop people from poaching. Um, indeed, dehorning remains one of, the, one of the strategies, one of the techniques that's being used. It's being used primarily in Namibia and South Africa. Um, it's not perfect. It's, it's expensive. It requires veterinary drugs. It requires expertise. Um, after the rhino horn is cut, it starts growing back fairly rapidly. There are examples of cases where rhinos have been killed even though they were dehorned out of retribution. I came all this way to get a rhino and you took the horn off, well I'll show you. There are also cases of um, the rhino being killed even to take a very small a couple of inches of regrowth and the horn of course starts regrowing immediately. So the removal of rhino horn is, is a partial solution, it's perhaps one tool. Um, another question that's been submitted is the question of what about elephant poaching? Um, an excellent question. Um, yes, indeed. Here, here we are talking about this new trend in rhino poaching. It is being mirrored by an upsurge in elephant poaching. We are also very concerned about it. Um, some of these techniques that we're talking about, including sort of escalating the whole idea that wildlife crime is, in fact, organized crime, we hope that it will have benefits for both rhinos and elephants. There's some other things I haven't talked about yet, but for example, the use of sniffer dogs in airports and seaports. Um, that is being done already. AWF is hoping to fund some additional sniffer dogs and some additional ports. They are, these dogs are trained and they are able to capture or to identify both rhino horn and elephant uh, ivory being smuggled. So um, that's an absolutely correct concern. We did decide to focus on rhino uh, in this meeting because rhino are much closer to extinction, of course. There's they're still about a half a million elephants in, in Africa. So while we're concerned, they don't, they're not literally living on the brink in quite the same way as rhino. Um, another question is, that was asked is, what are we doing about institutional corruption uh, in government agencies? Indeed, this is a big concern. Um, for example, South African National Parks, which has been sort of the engine of um, of the rehabilitation of the rhino's fortunes, they discovered that some of their very own, uh, some of their very own rangers, some of their very own vets were involved in this trade. Um, it's difficult. Um, the organizations that we talk to do have uh, intelligence gathering. They need, frankly, sort of spies and informers both inside the agency and outside the agency. It also goes to show why um, this, this problem cannot be isolated to one agency. You need different people collaborating so that you can sort of triangulate and find out um, who are the other people who, who might be involved um, in, 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 towing, in, in giving internal intelligence. Another question that's been asked is about some of the specific actions that AWF is taking now. Um, some of the actions we've taken, we funded the summit. I mentioned already that we've signed the MOU with WildAid and we are funding, uh, co-funding the development of a public awareness campaign for, for China and we hope to move that into, um, into uh, to Vietnam. There are several other things that we're looking at um, funding currently. Um, we have been funding for a long time um, one of the most important rhino sanctuaries in Kenya, which is uh, in Golia in Savo National Park. Um, of particular concern to us right now is Zimbabwe. Uh, as mentioned in an earlier slide, uh, after South Africa, Zimbabwe is the country losing the most rhino, and, South, and Zimbabwe has perhaps fewer resources to address that problem 
than anyone else. So I think that um, Zimbabwe is likely to be a focus of AWF investment on Rhino as well. Um, the last question that's been asked um, is about is about how people can help. And let me say um, there are a couple things you can do to help. Of course, we are looking for resources. All the things that we're talking about um, are taking a scaling up of resources. I do think there's a, a tone on the continent that everybody knows Africa has to do its part first, but help is needed, for example, funding this public awareness campaign in Asia. So getting the word out and also contributing as generously uh, as you can to rhino conservation efforts um, is very welcome. Well, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you again very much for joining me. Um, the webinar has been recorded, and we will send everyone a link to the file in case you'd like to watch it again or share it with a friend. And before you sign off, if you would take a moment to answer the survey and give me any feedback so that we can make these webinars as, uh, as useful as possible in the future. Thanks. Thanks very much, everyone.